Uh, well, and I have another uh, important introduction to make today. Um, and I was so excited actually to get to uh, be, not only be a part of this event, but be a part of this particular event because I have worked alongside uh, Peggy Patel for quite some time in our tourism development space um, and uh, on the business side of what the chamber does. And I was uh, very excited that Jesse and our team had lined her up to share with us today. So first off, just if you would introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about you and your story of how you got to where you are today. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm Keiki Patel, part of Exceptional Hospitality. It's a family-run business. Um, I actually have a very global upbringing. Uh, to, uh, right? I was technically born in India, but I was raised in Africa, in Zambia. I got educated in Canada. <laughs> I was in uh, the ninth grade when we moved to Canada. Uh, so did my high school, college in Canada, became a social worker, learned how to play chess at a homeless shelter, <laughs> uh, did a lot of volunteer work, um, worked at a suicide hotline in Canada uh, before I met my husband, uh, got married and uh, moved to Georgia about 23 years ago. Um, now that's where my journey into hospitality began. Um, I was working at a domestic violence shelter, uh, and um, my husband, who had just opened uh, Country Inn and Suites in Stone Mountain, had a director of sales who went out to Staples to buy some office supplies and never came back. <laughs> <laughs> Honest to God, the truth. <laughs> So he went on a search to find out. You, you would think that they would send in a resignation notice of some sort. No, he didn't get any of that. She just said, hey, Bimple, I'm going to go out to get some office supplies. And she just never decided to come back. <laughs> <laughs> so after his search for a director of sales for, for many days, he finally takes me out for dinner and sweet talks me. <laughs> into joining the family business. Now, mind you, when I first met my husband um, and I came over uh, to meet him in Atlanta, uh, I had no concept of what an exterior hotel is. I'm not sure if any of you know the difference between an interior hotel or an exterior hotel. I sure did it. <laughs> but that was my first exposure to uh, an exterior hotel. Right, and um, that's how I learned the terminology. That was my first terminology I learned that the days in is an exterior hotel. And then the country in is an interior hotel. Um, so anyway, uh, he sweet talks me into, um, into uh, joining the family business and says, there's lots of benefits of being self-employed. You know, we are planning on starting a family. You'll have flexible scheduling. You won't have to work. A work schedule, what you forgot to mention is that this is a 24 seven job. Yeah. <laughs> and you're always on call. <laughs> and that he was gonna be my boss. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, he left out a few things, um, but I joined the hospitality business uh, about 20 years ago, right? And, um, I, I decided that, you know, after some years of working in the hospitality business, that nonprofit and profit in the hospitality business is not so different a business. But um, hospitality is very much what I was doing before, only it's in the for profit sector. But um, you're still helping people. You're still negotiating. You're still trying to find the best deals at the cheapest <laughs> rates that you can. Um, and he had promised to train me. That didn't work out so well. <laughs> right? But my father-in-law, right, who actually has joined us via Zoom, right, he was essential in um, getting me trained uh, for the hospitality business. He has been in the for about 45 years or so. He has bought and sold hotels uh, many a times. Um, he built his uh, days in 
out right outside Stowe Park um, in uh, 1989 when everything passed there on Highway 78 was a dirt road. Um, right, so he has been in the business for a very, very long time. So he showed me the ropes. He said, this is what the numbers mean. I had no clue how to read any other hospitality reports like the star reports mm -hmm. or any other reports that are out there had no clue. Right. Um, my husband's fantastic with what he knows, but he's not the best of a teacher, <laughs> trainer or teacher. So my father-in-law taught me a lot of that. Right. Um, my mother-in-law taught me back of the house. Right. So I started off as director mm -hmm. of sales, right? Learned how to run the front desk. way through GM courses in several different brands with Choice Hotels, um, with Radisson Hotels, uh, with IAG, Wyndham, did all of the GM training programs, uh, actually truly understood what it was to be in the hospitality industry. When you're on the outside, it doesn't seem like much. Uh, from the other side of the desk, it just looks like Hey, how, how complicated can this be, right? You're renting a room, right? You're booking a reservation, you're getting checked in and checked out. How hard can that be, right? Well, it's true. it takes tremendous amount of work to make it look that seamless, right? Behind the scenes. Um, so learned a lot through all the training programs. Um, and uh, right now, uh, we in Forsyth County, we opened our country and suites in October of 2022 on Highway 400 on exit 14. Um, if you haven't been there, come and visit us. I have a fabulous general manager. Her name is Glenn Barrett. She'll be happy to host you and show you around. Um, yes, it's a fabulous property, a wonderful partner to the chamber, and like I mentioned, our tourism <laughs> development efforts. Um, and we, on that side of the work here, we're always excited for properties to open. Um, so you talked about kind of how you uh, learned the ropes, as you said. Let's chat a little bit about um, how you facilitate that for others that are, that are on your team now. What are your uh, key elements to succeeding in helping others to learn the ropes? You know, uh, one thing that I've realized, especially after working with my husband, it's not easy to be a trainer. <laughs> it's definitely not easy to be a trainer. You need a lot of patience and you need a lot of listening skills. Uh, you really do need to understand the other perspective. Um, when uh, you're training um, with my team specifically, um, I always like to think, I, I always tell them, listen, I'm going to repeat myself a lot, right? Even to this day, I'm, I'm continuously repeating myself because I don't know what my team knows unless they tell me that they don't know it, right? So um, the best thing that I ever do is repeat myself. Um, every time I repeat myself, somebody puts up their hand or will call me and say, hey, Keith, did I do something? Is this directed at me, right? Because that situation just happened at one of the hotels. And I'll say, no, 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 right? This is me reminding you, this is the procedures and this is what we do. Oh, okay, right? So having that open dialogue and not um, closing your door to um, you know, understanding where the other person is coming from, is key. A lot of times um, I find that um, I have staff members who haven't done something in a long time. Um, uh, let's say for, for instance, a fire drill. Um, how many of you are in a building and you have no idea what to do in case the fire drill uh, happens, right? But if you practice enough or you know, if you do it every six months, uh, hopefully you'll have a smidget of knowledge of what needs to happen, right? Even at home, how many of you have conducted fire drills at home? Nobody. <laughs> because we assume that our family understands what to do. We don't talk about it, right? So implementing that in business is what I like to do right, is because we don't use certain skills on a daily basis, 
right? As a leader, it becomes our responsibility to make sure that we're not just focusing on the skills that we use the most, but focus on the skills that we use the least, right? And lead by example, right? It does make us sound like broken records, to be honest with you, <laughs> when you're constantly reminding everybody, right? Oh yeah, don't forget to do this. Don't forget to do this. Don't forget to do this. But in the long run, I promise you, my team actually thanks me when the situation actually arises. Do you have some thoughts around um, how you not only build the skill set within your team members, but the strong relationships, the trust? I know from personal experience, we were just chatting about uh, a team member of yours that I have worked with that I know has been on your team for, we were joking about decades. Yes. How, how do you cultivate a culture where someone says, I'm going to stay here for decades with an S? <laughs> how would you say that you guys have done that? Well, you know, I have been truly blessed, to be honest with you. I have a fantastic staff. Um, each of my general managers, I couldn't be more thankful for. Um, uh, my Holiday Inn Express general manager, Elton, I can't, he has been with me for, oh my goodness, but many, many years. Uh, Ms. Barbara Mullen, she's the director of sales, at least over a decade or so. I actually have some of the original staff members uh, that actually work for us at our Country Inn & Suites from 2003 at the Country Inn & Suites. Um, so yeah, and uh, these are members who, if I lift something and they see me, they'll say, what are you doing? I'll do it for you. You have more important things to take care of, right? Um, so how we do that is by creating a culture of ownership in their work. Um, we try not to micromanage. We trust that once we train them and continue to do the retraining, that they will ask us valid questions and we treat them like family. But um, the most important thing is to allow our team members to own their mistakes. Um, one of the things mm -hmm. that I've learned a long time ago is that when team members make mistakes, um, I don't berate them. I, when I start, when I hire somebody, um, one thing I will promise them is that if they make a mistake or if they do something that is not necessarily how I do things, we will discuss it. That's a promise that I make. Right? Uh, the discussion is not necessarily about what went wrong. It's what could have we done differently. Right? Because I don't want to change the steps that they take. I want to change the thinking process of a team member. Right? So once you change the thinking process of a person in dealing with a particular situation, then the results will always be better than if they are just following some steps. Right? So um, that's how we do it. It's just like riding a bike. Once you figure out how to do it, you know, if you tell somebody, get on a bike and start pedaling, uh, right? That's not going to work. But allow them to actually feel the balance you know, or, or feel which way they need to go, make them understand how to balance, they're more likely to learn how to ride a bike, right? So that's how we maintain it. So for me, our family, our work family um, is actually family, right? And we will discuss every situation, good, bad, and the ugly, right? We laugh about things, we cry about things, um, we have fun, we spend a lot of time together, uh, we make jokes, um, we, you know, but definitely a family culture. And what about uh, setting goals uh, within that family culture uh, for everybody to work toward? And, and how do you go about motivating your team to get there? So that's been a very challenging issue for me because uh, it, each of the hotels that we have, are we at the top of the brand? So it's like telling your team, hey, I know you're getting a 10 out of 10, but uh, I need you to try for 11 out of 10. And it's kind of hard. So we have to be a little creative. 
right? So with our guests, what I try to do is because uh, we need something that can be scored with the brand. Each of the brands uh, send out surveys to our guests. And um, just like Chick-fil-A has the fifth mile, all right, I'm not sure if everybody's familiar with that, but uh, but um, we have uh, we have surveys. Uh, we call them depending on the brand. It's called something different. But when a guest receives a survey, they tell us how they felt at the hotel. That's what we measure our staff. Right? It's very subjective, right, to each individual person. So the goal for each staff member is to create a memorable experience at the hotel, right? So it's not good enough. A bed is a bed is a bed, right? You can go to up the road. You can stay at a courtyard. You can stay at a Hampton. You have many choices. All of our guests the hotel, right? So the point is to make it our namesake make it an exceptional and memorable experience. Right? We are not going for good or great or excellent. We are going for exception. So there's only two different kinds, uh, there's only two key kinds of people who write reviews. I want you to think about your experiences, whether it's at hotels or whether it's at restaurants. What makes you recommend a place or not recommend a place? It'll be one or two things. Either you were wowed or you were very disappointed, <laughs> right? <laughs> if it was average, you're not gonna talk about it as much, right? But if you are disappointed, you're gonna tell 10 people, right? If you are wowed, you're gonna tell 10 people, right? If it was, mm, it was all right, I don't know. You're not even gonna talk about it. You're gonna put it at the back of your mind and move on to the next place, right? So the goal for my team is get that wow, get that exception. As you assess what uh, what you guys are doing, which it sounds like you have quite the, the system in place to go about doing that and taking assessments, um, and you face a challenge or a hurdle that the team is struggling to overcome, uh, do you have recommendations on how you as a leader approach that uh, and, and try to get the group to move beyond that challenge? I usually have a meeting but uh, with the group of people or with individuals, usually involve my management team in it. And I actually ask them for solutions and them for ideas. But um, as a leader, my belief is that I don't need to be the smartest person in the room. I just need people who are smarter than me in the room. <laughs> <laughs> and I just need people who are more creative than I am to come up with solutions, right? So I'll get the group together and I'll say, hey, this is what I need to accomplish, right? Uh, these are the hurdles. What are some of your ideas, right? And then once you get those ideas, and again, this feeds into creating that culture of family as well giving um, your team members a sense of ownership in what's going on, right? And, uh, you know, if the idea succeeds, they get to brag about it. They, that was their idea. They own it, right? They push it, right? So to me, that's what I do when I get into, uh, you know, if I need results and there's an obstacle, I get that group of people in, okay, this is the issue. How are we going to resolve it? All right, they come up with three or four ideas. And then I'll say, okay, well, this one is the most possible one. This one is the most possible one. All right, A, B, let's try A first. If A doesn't work, we'll go with B. All right, in most cases, that has always worked out. Are there any uh, tools or resources that you have utilized to ensure that you're continuing to cultivate that um, creative an innovative nature in your team members to, to look at those challenges through an innovative lens? You know, this might sound old school, <laughs> but with so much technology going on, uh, years ago, I adopt, adopted WhatsApp as a work, <laughs> you know, for work purposes. And um, 
we have at the brand level, um, all of our hotels have all these technology tools that work, but found out uh, through trial and error that WhatsApp groups for each hotels works great, right? It, it works great. Um, my only rules for that uh, our tool is that uh, you don't do negative posting and call out an individual person, right? If somebody has an issue with somebody else, please come and talk to me in person. Um, what I, and this is again through trial and error, right? But um, a, a lot of half our staff do not speak English, right? So having this tool, right, has really, really helped. So each of the hotel, uh, the staff communicates about what needs to happen on the premises. If there's any issues in the building, if there's any issues with guests, if there's a funny story that they want to share, <laughs> right? If there are birthdays that get celebrated, small wins, uh, I post our scores on it. Um, we make jokes uh, if we decorate some stuff or it's hollow, uh, Halloween and we have staff members who have come dressed up, we do it on WhatsApp. It's become a chat group, right, for each individual hotel. And it's fantastic. <laughs> Very cool. And what about for yourself, just personally? What resources, what tools do you go to to stay uh, on top of leadership trends, to enhance your own leadership skill set? Where do you go for that? I typically go to, I attend a lot of conferences uh, with the brands. Um, I make sure that I'm there. I attend all the workshops. I continuously retrain myself. Uh, attend sessions like this, <laughs> hear from different speakers, um, what the trends are, um, you know, that's what I do. Um, so you mentioned the, the hospitality piece, and I wanted to be sure that um, we touched on customer service because customer service is in every workplace. But I think when you talk about hospitality, that's a step further and a step further than, uh, than some businesses have to deliver when they're looking to deliver customer service. Can you tell us a bit just around your philosophy uh, on that, delivering that as a brand beyond just specific team members? Well, for the brand, um, all my philosophy is treat others as you would like to be treated. As simple as that, right? Um, you know, to make it any more complicated than that, um, I think <laughs> makes it too philosophical. You know, it's, uh, it's out of reach. Treat others genuinely, uh, treat them like they are your parents, that they are your kids and nieces, nephews, and you will achieve that connection with your guests, right? Um, our guests, um, I like to remind our team that um, our guests are the ones who pay our bills, right? So, you know, you will find, you know, I said this before, a bed is a bed is a bed. But when you walk into my hotel, I promise you, you will never meet another cakey anywhere else. <laughs> right? So when I'm talking to you, hopefully, right, um, you know, my philosophy comes out, right, and connects with you and says, hey, I am 100% present uh, mentally and physically in front of you. My sole focus is you. I am talking to you, right? You can feel that in my actions and in my conversations with you, right? It's a very difficult thing to accomplish. So. It, it is, but you know, treat others as you want to be treated, right? So, and you will achieve your goals. Um, so I know that, uh, in this role, um, when James leads these discussions for the whole past year, something that we touch on, no matter who, uh, what leader he is talking to, no matter what industry they're in, is the workforce. Uh, it is at the forefront of our minds here at the chamber because we hear it from all of you that it is very much in your forefronts. And I know from uh, the tourism side of what the chamber does, it is on the forefront of the hotel business. Yes. So I think we've talked a little bit about the talent retention piece for you guys and how you cultivate that in your family culture. 
Um, what about the recruitment side of things? What have uh, what strategies have you found to be successful in ensuring that you have had a workforce? You know, this has been a very difficult issue for us, especially in the hospitality industry. Um, you know, um, I you know, you know maybe it's the generation that I was coming from. For me, when I was growing up in Toronto, uh, I remember um, in high school. Oh, I, my first job was as a newspaper delivery person. <laughs> oh, I, oh, why? Because my dad thought he should teach me a lesson about not having overdue library books and paying the fines. So he said, well, I'm tired of paying the fines. You're going to get yourself a job. Right? And uh, uh, you know, somebody that we knew wanted to give up the newspaper route. So I took it on and started delivering newspapers in minus 22 weather in Toronto. Right? Uh, that taught me a lesson to stick to my job and find a job that I enjoy or can at least get through. After that, I started working at KFC, um, did my high school through KFC. Yes, I worked at fast food, but again, I had gas to pay for <laughs> <laughs> and insurance to pay for, right? So, um, you know, so I come from a, I guess, uh, uh, come from a generation where you work hard, you stick with what you got, you get those bills paid and look at the long run. Now I'm finding that the labor force does not think that way. Why right? they are thinking not of paying bills. Why right? um, I find many a times where I've hired somebody and they, I would be lucky if they show up on the first day of the job. I set up 10 interviews. I will be lucky if one person actually shows up for an interview. Right. And if that person shows up for the interview, you are hired. <laughs> right? Now, once you are hired, the next struggle is when you show up on the first day of the job. If you show up on the first day of the job, it's like, oh, great. Second huddle. <laughs> now, can I get you in a uniform? Right? So I order the uniform. By the time the uniform comes in, that person has already gone bye-bye. Mm -hmm. uh, and that happens about 70% of the time. Oh, yeah. so uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> Does this situation mm -hmm. happen to both the Indian and uh, American family? Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, in the hospitality, this is notorious. If you ever go to, at the conventions that we attend, um, you know, it's filled with owners from all across the United States. We have some 6,000 to 7,000 uh, attendees. Um, we have a choice conference coming up in April. This is usually the topic of conversation, right? We have all, we have workshops around this, right? The first struggle is just them showing up. And uh, at this point, we don't even focus on how you're dressed anymore. <laughs> they come in in flip-flops and the etiquette of interviewing, dressing for an interview is no longer there, right? I almost feel like we need a class in high school that teaches interview etiquette, dressing etiquette, all right? Um, it's needed in high school. Right. Um, I don't remember ever, even for my job at, at KFC, I wore a suit. Right. Uh, you know, so now if you're going to go and find a job, if an interview at a fast food restaurant, that person's going to come in a hoodie. Right. They're not going to come in a suit. Right. They're going to come in running shoes and they're going to come in a hoodie. Right. So expectations from employers to even have somebody dress right, uh, appropriately, uh, has had to be lowered. Fortunately, here in Forsyth County, they do have those spots. They're just not required for everyone. It's only if they're in the business or, like, teaching or that type of thing. So, but that is a requirement mm -hmm. that I actually help out okay. with the decking clubs. I need the marketing clubs and stuff like that for their interview. Across all the pathways for their union and scene, and then for the decker club comp comp mm -hmm. competitions. They have those, it's just up to the, 
the schools to make them mandatory for all students. Yeah, no, that is wonderful to hear because honest to God, um, it has come to a point where my expectations as an employer are lowered, right? Um, because, and if somebody does come dressed appropriately for an interview, because, you know, right, it actually is, I'm surprised by it. <laughs> and I'm pleased. <laughs> and I was like, it, it's, uh, it's wonderful to see that, uh, you know, and see that etiquette, um, right? Uh, so, you know, moving past that, it's, uh, you know, having that job interview and then having them show up. And if they, if the person doesn't uh, like what they see in that work environment, the, I see that labor force is very quick to move on. Mm -hmm. Because of the shortage of labor, they are able to, the labor force is able to find a replacement really fast because employers' expectations have lowered. Right, and there's jobs are plenty out there. Competition is fierce. So, in my during my recruitment pro process with exceptional hospitality, one of the things that I try to do is if I find an appropriate candidate, right, I will invest in training with them, and I will invest in making it pay appropriate. Right, I can't do it um, as a business owner. Um, I have my limitations. Um, right, uh, you have to look at the books, you have to look at revenue. Uh, you can't just figure that you can give everybody a $55 an hour job, right? Uh, it's not realistic, right? Wish we could afford that, but seriously, you can't, right? So um, I look for uh, when I'm recruiting, once I get through the first, I always tell everybody, you know, we'll do a probation period of 90 days. Right. Uh, after 90 days, if I know that this person is willing and able to learn and, you know, be with my company culture, right, then I'm willing to invest in more training and more pay for that person. But it will have to be individually assessed. Well, I um, as we uh, can tell, it is a, an issue. Uh, across the board, um, but thank you for sharing the perspective from the hospitality side. I'd love to open it up um, for questions in the room uh, and certainly our virtual attendees, feel free to uh, raise your virtual hand as well to let us know if you guys have a question. Um, but what questions do you all have for Katie? Please. On the employees that you're getting to the 90 day probation period, what percent is even getting to that point? I haven't really looked at the percentage but I do, I can tell you that the folks who have lasted at 90 days have made it past the first two weeks. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. I can pretty much tell within the first two weeks if the person's going to last. Right. Um, and some of the things that, um, that, that has worked in our favor is um, when I look at the scheduling. How flexible are they? Their willingness to come in, their willingness to put on that uniform, their willingness to actually listen and take notes as they are training. Um, right? Um, if they don't have the know-it-all attitude, right? Um, the entitlement attitude, um, and you know, I'm entitled to this, and I'm entitled to this. Uh, if they don't have that attitude. Uh, they will go far with me and my company, right? Uh, but I have had a lot of people who have come in with the know-it-all attitude because they have worked in different hotels and then undoing the bad habits is very difficult, right? So when I'm recruiting, having hotel experience for my company is not necessarily a plus, right? <laughs> because undoing bad habits is harder than teaching new habits. So um, you mentioned um, like company culture, you know, like within the first 90 days, how they fit in that company culture. Do you have anyone that maybe was trainable, learnable, but like just didn't fit in your company culture? And how did you handle that? I did. And unfortunately I had to let them go. Okay. Um, right. Uh, because it would have, created an issue with the entire hotel. Uh, if you have, um, whenever I hire somebody, they have to fit in with the rest of the team, 
It's like, what does that mean specifically? Right. It means that they are a team player, right? So uh, it means that they understand the concept of uh, passing the ball to the next person, right, without having it drop, right? It means that they're an active listener, right? And they're open to new ideas and people doing things differently, right, than their own, as long as the end result is the same. Why, um, without having to take things personally. Taking things personally is one of the biggest obstacles I find. Right? Um, because uh, everybody likes to do things differently. But if at the end of the day, you have accomplished that goal, why, without personally offending anybody, right? That's a huge accomplishment. Right? So, that's what it means to be part of the team. I've actually let people go because they haven't fit in because I've actually had, um, this was uh, last year actually, I hired a night auditor at one of my hotels and um, within two weeks, <laughs> I had three staff members come to me individually and say, Keiki, I'm willing to do overtime. <laughs> I'm willing to do double shifts. Why, right. if it means we are short staffed, if you have to let this person go. Oh, wow. wow. <laughs> yeah. So that tells you a lot. Right? Yeah. That tells you a lot. Three different people, right? And I could not understand, right, what they were, where they were coming from. So I had to have a sit down with my front desk manager and say, what is going on? Right, this person has a fantastic resume. She already knows the hotel industry. She knows the system. She's excellent with customers, right? And the response was, she's just not a team player. It's either her way or the highway, right? So you're gonna have one or two things happen, Keiki. You're gonna have the folks that have been with you for years quit and leave, right? Because they cannot stand working with her. Right. Uh, or you're going to have to do something about her. Mm -hmm. Right. So my choice was I'm not going to rehire my entire team. I'm going to have to let this one person go. I've got one. Okay. Yeah, this is perhaps a question for the chamber. Well, um, I think when your hotel is located within the city limits, they pay. Correct. I don't know if you're aware of that. Uh, what are those dollars used for? There's some helping the hotels kind of brand themselves. Um, I think a lot of people don't know about that. Um, can you share a little bit about what those dollars are used for? Yeah. I, do you want to go first? Well, just to explain that, uh, at the hotel, uh, we uh, all guests are charged three different taxes. Uh, we have the state tax that goes directly to the state. Then we have the occupancy tax that goes to the county. And then we have the flat $5 tax uh, that Nathan Deal did, right? That goes to the state. I have no idea. It's something to do with transportation. Uh, <laughs> but well, it's $5 a night. Right. Right. But in Forsyth County, that totals up to 12% uh, plus the flat five, uh, $5. Right. And um, the occupancy tax goes to the county. Yeah, so the, the occupancy tax is what um, uh, Forsyth County receives. Uh, hotel motel uh, tax is also uh, how that's indicated. And um, there is actually a great deal of state restriction on how those dollars get spent. Um, and so uh, case in point, uh, the chamber um, acts as a contracted vendor to Forsyth County government to do tourism development work. Um, working alongside our hotels, our hospitality sector businesses. Um, and so for Forsyth County, uh, a huge portion of our tourism space, because I know oftentimes people, uh, you know, kind of think tourism in Forsyth County, um, but uh, really the amateur sporting market is a huge driver for us. I don't think it's probably news to anyone in this room how outstanding our park and rec facilities are. Um, and they are filled 
almost year round uh, with traveling teams. Um, and so uh, when those teams come in, uh, it's often, I know there's even some folks in the room that were talking about, uh, you know, having uh, kids involved in that type of sporting event. And often when that happens, it's not just uh, those players coming, it's their families. Uh, and they're coming to our community staying in our hotels, um, enjoying our restaurants uh, and shops. And um, it's a it's a huge driver into our economy. And that's kind of why the Chambers uh, works in that space as well. Um, we're hoping this month to have our new Vice President of Tourism Development in place. Uh, and uh, excited, firstly, I'm very excited to get them going in that role. Yeah, Jan. I like to dump things down for Where me. Where is it? You fell up. Oh, I think about the uh, hotel motel tax, where you guys, where the county, it, it drives income to the county and to the state. But for our local community, that our county taxes would all be really much, pretty much driven by our property taxes um, to kind of have the work and the live space that we have here. Isn't that a way to also kind of diversify that so that people who don't live in our county can help pay for their facilities mm -hmm. and the roads and the just the parks and things that they may use yeah, in our county? It saves every household in Forsyth County uh, around $150 per household. Uh, and you should sell more hotels in Forsyth County. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so I have a question. Uh, what do you see? For the hotel, the future of the hotel business with the competition coming from, you know, location rental, Airbnb, Verbo, for example. And what is your strategy toward those competition? So personally, for um, now, I have there's a lot of debate about where that's going to go with Airbnb and um, in the rental market. Um, I am personally seeing a lot of backlash against it, uh, right? Because a lot of counties uh, throughout the country uh, are having our rules and regulations put into place against that in certain neighborhoods. A lot of our residential neighbors are speaking out against that. Uh, they don't want rental properties in their neighborhoods. So they specific, like if you go to Florida, uh, Kissimmee um, uh, specifically, you'll see a lot of neighborhoods specifically built with that in mind, right? So it's gonna become a different segment on its own. Travelers are beginning to realize that while there are some advantages to renting a house through Airbnb, um, there's also some disadvantages. Um, there's a lot of scams out there where people rent, they show up to the location and it's a false address or it's just a parking lot. Mm -hmm. Yes, but um, you show up and the uh, and the space that you go into isn't clean or sanitized properly. That's been the biggest issue with hotels. Um, you know, when you're staying at a hotel, a reputable hotel, you know they have standards that they have to adhere to, right? Both county as well as brand standards. Um, there are some key brands out there. One is uh, Marriott, of course. Um, then you have the Hilton brand of hotels. You have IG brand of hotels. And then you have Choice brand of hotels. And there's several others, of course. There's a Hyatt and so forth. Um, but um, these are the key four brands out there right now. Each of those brands have approximately an average of about uh, 17 um, brand of hotels underneath that corporate umbrella, right? So you have everything from an economy brand, uh, which gives you the basics, right? No frills to a full service luxury resort experience and everything in between. So you have the uh, economy, mid-scale and higher and luxury. Most customers tend to go towards um, the mid-scale brands. Uh, mid-scale brands, uh, examples of that are uh, Holiday Express, uh, Country Inn & Suites, Comfort Inn, Courtyard, Spring Hill, Fairfields. Those are all your mid-scales, right? So, and those are the ones that offer um, the free breakfast. They have a pool, they have free internet. They're clean, they're sanitary, they have standards where everything um, 
uh, it, that's clean has a procedure right? Mm -hmm. Where a room that's checked out is cleaned differently than a room that is a stay over. And you may have noticed this when you stay at hotels. Um, there'll be a little card in the room that will tell you, please let us know. Somewhere along the lines of, Frida, please let us know if you'd like your sheets to be changed, right? If your sheets look fairly clean and you're staying over, uh, and you're not planning on checking out to conserve, become um, uh, to conserve energy to go green. They'll reutilize that uh, those sheets again, but they will clean and sanitize your restroom. All of that still gets sanitized, but will reuse your products again. Uh, if it's a checkout room, regardless of whether um, a bed is used or not, whether a towel is used or not everything in the room is removed, right? Everything is clean and sanitized and put right back in, right? Now, going to the Airbnb, you don't know that, right? You, you don't know that. You don't know who has cleaned <laughs> that, uh, that house. You don't know what the standards are around that. You don't know whether how many days or weeks or months it's been since the blankets and the towels were clean. You don't know that the folded towel that's there has been sitting there for months and it's accumulated bacteria and dust. You don't know that, right? Uh, you will get the cheapest toilet paper that's out there. You'll get paper cups. <laughs> 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 yeah, so you'll get, yeah, but you'll get, you know, so you don't know whether the dishes were cleaned, what you don't know what you're getting essentially, right? You don't know whether the floors were clean and mopped and sanitized. You're not going to get that with a hotel. If it's a good, <laughs> reputable hotel, you're not going to get that. I had a cat one time. Not you kidding. Had... There was a cat there and she said, oh, do you mind letting, just don't let the cat out. It's like, what? what? <laughs> <laughs> She said, well, the litter box is over there. And then she shut it and left. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm taking care of a cat. Exactly. <laughs> 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 I had no idea you were a nanny, too. I think. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. 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 I, I don't personally see it because customers are coming around. Consumers are coming around. They're beginning to understand, especially since COVID. Well, right. they're beginning to see this. And, you know, personally, my view is, why am I renting a house where I have to go and clean and pay other people? Right, it does not make sense. Right, when I'm paying to stay somewhere, I already want to clean and sanitize and I don't want to have to doubt something. Right, I want staff easily available to fix the AC or whatever the issue that came up. If there's no hot water, I want it fixed. If my toilet doesn't fl uh, flush, I want some of the maintenance guy to come in and plunge the toilet. I don't want to have to do it myself, especially when I paid somebody else for this. <laughs> I think what's helping too is some of the HOAs now are cracking down on that. Exactly. And we're saying you can't do that anymore. Exactly. You know, I'm a president of one in, in the community here. We don't, we allow 5%. Yeah, so it's a lot of people are speaking out against it because the standards are crazy. You might have heard on the news um, mansions being rented out and all these parties taking place and they crash the place. And you're looking at neighborhoods where the houses are worth millions of dollars, right? You don't want that. You don't want this in your neighborhood, right? Yeah, so people are turning away from it slowly but surely. Yeah, I know in Forsyth County, they have a rule, you can't do an Airbnb um, unless it's rented more than 30 days. Yeah. So to help with that. Yeah. Really That's all I can Like rentals too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like rentals are regulated now. Yeah. You can't do over it. Yeah. You can't do short-term rental. Everything needs to be 30 days or longer. Yeah. The regulations around it are just not very concrete right now. They are very static. Right. So, and consumers are seen. Right. And specifically because of sanitization standards, uh, they're coming back to hotels more and more and they're seeing the benefits of it. So our family, we have five children and they're all adults now. And the one benefit we like about an Airbnb is um, we all get to stay together like when we were younger. Right, when our kids were younger. That part I do enjoy. We took a trip to Sonoma and did that. 
it was awesome, except the house was filthy and I couldn't stand it. And so now we're going to my niece's wedding and I'm like, I will block the hotel rooms and we'll stay in a hotel. <laughs> and the only thing we're going to miss is, um, it, it's unfortunate because like we love that game time, right? Where mm -hmm. we just kind of, you know, sit around, have snacks, have, you know, cocktails or whatever because they're all the way now I was a little drinking in front of me. Um, you know, we have we do that, and that's the only thing that cannot be replicated that I wish a hotel could re re replicate for us. I have a recommendation for that. Now, if you come to any exceptional hospitality hotel, but um, when we have families come to us, and a lot of hotels are open to this, why right? ask them if they'll if you especially if you have five rooms or more, why right? ask them if they'll throw in the meeting space for free. Oh, right. Uh, talk to them about that. A um, lot of hotels, especially the newer hotels and the renovated hotels, are offering um, a spacious uh, hangout spots in the lobby. Right. Just talk to the general manager. The breakfast rooms are available for free. You're not paying extra for any of this stuff. Um, the only thing I will caution you about is if you are hosting a cocktail hour, right, you may want to kind of uh, I disguise it in a coffee cup. <laughs> <laughs> Amazon has some great ideas, right? So that, that's yeah. right. You can get yourself a Stanley or something, yeah. right? Um, but uh, did, it's uh, because certain counties, um, that, you know, they have uh, limitations on public consumption of alcohol, yeah. right? So keeping that in mind uh, and keeping in mind that not everybody likes drinking or public displays of drinking, mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, be considerate and make sure that you disguise your glasses or bottles, right? Uh, that will keep the staff from having to come to you and say, I'm so sorry, but drinking's not allowed in the lobby. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, but um, talk to the general manager, talk to the staff of the hotels that you're going to. I promise you, right, most of them will welcome you and give you a spot in the hotel, in the lobby, uh, in the meeting space. There'll be a den, like oh, the one that we have over here. We have a patio that you can uh, gather around. There's actually a den where families can gather around. We have a huge breakfast space. We have a meeting space. You know, when we have teams that come in, uh, we offer them a meeting room for free so they can go and gather and have breakfast together as a team. Right? Yeah, nice. just talk to them. Oh, I never thought of that because that's lovely because that's the only thing we miss. Yeah, no, talk to them. They'll give you a gathering space and some hotels actually have hospitality suites. Okay. Ask them if they have one. Nice. Well, Becky, you have taken us uh, through leadership, workforce development, and now cocktail hour. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so thank you so much. Will you guys join me in thanking Katie today? <laughs>